Thank you very much. Thank you, ushers. So there was a pastor that uh, was giving a sermon, and his sermon was on the evils of alcohol. Don't, I'm not going there. <laughs> Don't worry. But he was talking about some of the things that his church was engaged in. And he said something to the congregation. He said, you know, if I had all the beer in this town, you know what I would do with it? I would pour it in the river. And then he said, if I had all the wine in this town, I would take all that wine and collect it and also pour it in the river. And with that, he looked over at the choir director, who also happened to be W-I-F-E. She liked to have a glass of wine with every meal. And then he looked at some of the men at the church sitting in the back, and he said, you know, if I had all the whiskey in this town, I would also pour it in the river. And he went on with the sermon. Finally, when he sat down, he looked over at the choir director who had a real scowl on her face, and he was like, what? What do you want me to do? And she sat there for a minute, and then she popped up and went over to the hymn, and she was shuffling around. She goes, okay, for the hymnal response today, we are going to change. We're going to look at hymn number 342, Shall We Gather at the River? <laughs> but he asked a very interesting question, what do you want me to do? And that's the title of our sermon today, What Do You Want Christ to Do for You? You know, it's an interesting question. If you ask different people, they will give you different answers. Some people talk about, hey, I ask God for personal needs, provision, protection, healing, guidance, all of which are very good. Others will ask for spiritual growth, for sanctification, for forgiveness, for peace. Others will ask for requests pertaining to God's kingdom, salvation, and glory. You know, according to the Bible, Christ has done many things. He's healed the sick, he's raised the dead, he's fed the hungry, calmed the storm, cast out demons, taught the truth, fulfilled the law, died for sinners, rose from the grave. And today we're going to study a passage in the Bible coming from Mark chapter 10. It's an account of a man who gets healed. God, uh, Jesus heals his blindness. Now this individual, Bartimaeus, is not the first person to have had his visual impairment healed. But there is something interesting about this passage. Let me read it to you. It comes from Mark chapter 10, starting with verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, and Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received a sight and followed Jesus along the road. Now, I don't know about you, but after an initial reading of this, you, you may think, well, it's not that remarkable. It's another healing. It's a good story. But if you look at this from a granular level, there are so many lessons that we can learn from this. And I like to look at this from the perspective of each of the parties, from Bartimaeus' perspective, from Jesus' perspective, and from the crowd's perspective. And my hope is that after we study this today, that we will begin to identify with one of them. And actually, if I'm honest with you, I can identify a little with each of them. Now, let me ask you a question. Do any of you have problems with your vision? How about in the back row? Oh, there's a few of you. I'm going to tell the background, there is a cure. You want to know what the cure is? Yeah? Come down, sit down the front. It's amazing. When you sit in the front, you can actually see things clearly. But I'm actually the poster boy 
of having bad eyesight. I've had uh, quite acute myopia, nearsightedness, since I was relatively young. And then at a DBICC event, I had some trauma. Uh, a ball hit my sunglasses that I was wearing. And as a result, I began to lose vision in one of my eyes. And that was, uh, that was because one of my retinas, my left eye retina, became detached. And so that required uh, very immediate surgery. I had to go in the sanatorium. And they won't let you go. They said, no, no, we've got to repair it right away. You cannot wait. And so they, what they do is they open your eye, and they remove the vitreous, the, uh, the, the jelly in your eye that gives it structure. And they get to the back, and they use a laser, and they pin the retina to the back of your eye. And then once they do that, they somehow put your eye back together. But now, you don't have that vitreous anymore. So the eye will actually collapse like a deflated balloon. And in my case, they pumped a gas into my eye, like a balloon. And the pain was so extensive. The only way I can imagine telling you this is as, it's as if somebody took their thumb and pressed it against your eyeball. And it stayed that way for three months. The reason they put the gas in there is one, to give it structure, like I said, but also it acts as a cast to hold your retina in place so that it will not come off again. And slowly, your eye fills up with a liquid. There is no jelly that replaces it. It's a, it's a liquid. But until that liquid fills your eye, you can't see. You're blind. It's translucent, you can see light, but you cannot see any vision properly. And after that one healed, three months later, my right eye did the same thing. God was merciful. He didn't let both of them go at the same time. I always had one eye that was operational. But I know what it means to be blind. I know what it is like to see. And if you look at the Bible, this particular healing is not the first one. I actually count, I think, at least two others, right? You have Jesus healing uh, the blind individual uh, in Siloam by putting spit into his eyes. He, hot, he also healed another individual who was blind since birth by putting some clay uh, into his eyes. And uh, actually, sorry, the first individual was uh, healed in Bethsaida. The second one, he had to wash the clay out of his eyes from a pool in Siloam. And actually, you can act, count Saul as well. Saul on the road to Damascus was not only healed at a later time, but he was blinded by Jesus, remember? A flash of light and caused him to be blind, and he said, you know, continue on and wait for further instruction before he regained his sight. Now, Bartimaeus, we don't know anything about his friends or his family, but I think there's one thing that we can infer is that there wasn't anybody that cared for him or supported him or that he was well-respected in society. People tried to silence him. So we're gonna look at, as I said before, this story from the perspective of three different individuals, and we're gonna start with Bartimaeus. In verse 46 and 47, it says that he was sitting by the roadside and began calling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the one thing I noticed was, you don't ask for a doctor unless you know you're sick. You don't ask for your sight unless you know you're blind. And you don't ask for a savior unless you know you're a sinner. And I wonder to myself, do we know that? Maybe it's ironic that some of the people within the crowd didn't realize, or maybe they were blind to the fact that they needed healing, spiritual healing. But what about us? The second thing I notice is that Bartimaeus' interest in Jesus was not just a marginal one. He wasn't there window shopping. He wasn't there people watching, was he? He couldn't see the crowd. He didn't think to himself, hey, why are all these people walking through here? I remember 
one time when I was working at the bank, we, our office was at uh, Chater House, and uh, I had a meeting next door at the Mandarin Oriental, and so we had to go to the coffee shop, and the meeting took far longer than I expected, and we were, by the time I came out, it was actually dark. And so I came out the front door, which is on Connaught Road, and uh, it was just lined full of people. And you know the walkway that goes from Exchange Square to Worldwide House? That walkway, packed full of people, and they're all looking through, uh, looking through that uh, hole, the holes in the walkway, trying to see what's going on. They're all, their gaze was focused at the Mandarin. And I was wondering, what is going on here? It wasn't until I f came back to Discovery Bay that I find out that a very famous singer and actor, Jackie Chung, took a dive off the roof that day, and people were there looking and lined up, expecting something to happen. Well, this was not the case for Bartimaeus. He wasn't there just wondering what happened. He was there intentionally. He strategically posi positioned himself at the side of the road where he thought Jesus was going to walk by. He placed himself where he thought he would have the best vantage point in shouting out to Jesus. The third thing that I noticed about Bartimaeus is he didn't let anybody stop him. He wasn't going to let anybody silence him. He wasn't going to let anybody embarrass him. He wasn't going to let anybody shame him into quietness. That tells me Bartimaeus was not Asian. <laughs> Asians are afraid of being embarrassed. Asians are afraid of having shame. I, I remember when, uh, after I got married, not long after that, and Sarah moved to Discovery Bay, and she found out that I'm willing to stop and talk to anybody, she said something to me. She would say, hey, can you be a little bit more shy? <laughs> but Bartimaeus wasn't like that. Bartimaeus didn't let this little voice inside his head say, hey, just quiet down. Maybe Jesus has more important things to do than to speak with you. No, he knew that this was his one chance to have a close-up encounter, a personal encounter with Jesus. And so he knew I probably can't make it all the way up, so I'm going to shout. And when he shouted, what did he say? Son of David, have mercy on me. He knew who Jesus was, son of David. The question I ask myself is, do I? Even before Bartimaeus had a personal contact with Jesus, he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Son of David is the term that refers to the promised Messiah, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The title refers to the messianic pro uh, promise in Isaiah chapter 9, that the Messiah would be a descendant of David whose kingdom would last forever. In other words, Bartimaeus knew Jesus was the one that we are waiting for. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. In other words, Christ is the fulfillment of a Messiah that would rule forever. Jesus was the yes to all the promises that God has made. And the fact that Jesus responded to the title, Son of David, shows that he confirms his identity. He confirms that he is the rightful heir to the throne. Do we recognize that Jesus is the Messiah? Or do we just think of Jesus as sort of a, a buddy? And I was thinking about this, I, I think back to my school days, you have Amy Grant songs we played on the record and Amy Grant would talk about, oh, I'm so in love with Jesus, which thinking, that's kind of strange. <laughs> but yeah, do we have the proper frame of reference that God or Jesus is the Messiah? The next thing I noticed was Bartimaeus's garment, his cloak. In verse 50, it says, he threw his cloak aside and jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Well, what's so important about that? What's so important about his cloak-throwing moment. Well, a cloak 
back in those days, in their culture, was a very important piece of garment. It's a long garment that goes from your neck to your ankles. It not only sheltered them from the elements and gave them warmth, but I'm thinking, Bartimaeus is a beggar. He probably doesn't own a lot of things. Could very well be he sleeps on the street. So that cloak, he might have rolled it up and used it as a pillow. Or he maybe laid it out and used it as a mattress. Or maybe when it was cold, he used the cloak as a blanket to keep him warm. Another thing is that by being a beggar, I'm thinking that cloak might have been a tool of the trade. You know, he cannot see when people are coming by. When you see a beggar, typically they have something to collect the coins or dollar bills, right? It could be a bowl, it could be a cup. I've seen musicians use the instrument cases to open them up. But it was a tool of trade for him to make his living. It's like a carpenter, he needs a hammer. And a plumber, he needs a wrench. And like a programmer, he'll need a computer, right? And uh, you pilots, you're nothing without a plane. You need, that's the tool of your trade. And for Bartimaeus, it was his cloak. He laid it out in front of him. It was important to him. But Bartimaeus, it says, it's described that he just simply cast it aside. He cast aside his security, all that he owned, and an important tool to help him with his only source of income. So my question to us is, what is our cloak? What's holding us back? What's slowing us down from coming to Christ like Bartimaeus did? Is it our time? How about our possessions? Our kids? You know, for many of us, especially those with young kids, your schedules are based on their school schedules. God, I don't have time for you right now. I gotta help them with their exams. What about our finances? God, if I can get more money first, you know, I'll, I'll spend more time in ministry. But we should be like Bartimaeus. We should be desperate to come to Jesus. We should want to be with him and not let anything get in our way, not even a critical item like his cloak. The next group I'll look at is the crowd, from the crowd's perspective. In verse 46, it talks about the fact that Jesus came with his disciples together with a large crowd. And in verse 48, it says, many rebuked him, rebuked Bartimaeus and told him to be quiet. And then the leader said to him, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Seems a little incongruent. But the crowd, how did they view Bartimaeus initially? They probably thought of him as an annoyance, right? A nuisance. Somebody who is socially insignificant. Somebody that is slowing them down from getting to where they wanted to be. Some translations of the Bible, like the NIV that we're looking at, it uses the term rebuke. It's a strong word. You know, the dictionary, it says, rebuke is to express sharp disapproval or criticism because of somebody's behavior or actions. I don't like being rebuked. Nobody likes to be rebuked. But they rebuked Bartimaeus. Why? Again, they're slowing him down. Imagine that. Slowing them down from what? Going to Jerusalem. We gotta get to Jerusalem. We're gonna go celebrate the Passover. Hey, don't bother me. I gotta get to work. I'm late. I'm rushing to a meeting. My, my, my wife has reservations at the dim sum restaurant. She's gonna be really upset if I don't get there. Don't bother me. Or I gotta get to church. I'm late. It's 10.05. People that slow us down, we don't want to pay attention to them. But Jesus stopped and said, call him. When he said, call him, he's addressing the crowd, isn't he? I love the dynamics of this dialogue. You have Bartimaeus calling out to Jesus, son of God, son of, son of David, have mercy on me. And then you have the crowd yelling at Bartimaeus, hey, shush up. 
And then when Jesus talks, he's not addressing Bartimaeus, he's addressing the crowd. He's saying, call him. You have a triangle of communication here. And what happens? When they said, when, when Jesus says, call him, they call to Bartimaeus, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. When you say cheer up, to me, it shows that they have an immediate change in their attitude, right? Jesus commanded them to call him, and so they went from rebuking to encouraging. They went from rebuking to encouraging. They went from seeing Barnabas, Bartimaeus as an annoyance to a person from the optics of Jesus, somebody that Jesus cared for. We don't normally encourage somebody unless we actually care for them, right? And so this change in the heart of the crowd came about when Jesus spoke with them. Normally, people read this passage and they see this as a miracle, one of the miracles that Jesus did, a healing miracle. But I think Jesus is also teaching us through teaching the crowd. We shouldn't shush other people. We shouldn't view other people as annoyances. We need to take notice of people like Bartimaeus, that Jesus cares enough for them to pay attention to them. You know, had it been up to the crowd, Jesus would have passed right by, and Bartimaeus would still be in his same initial position. But Jesus stopped to speak to Bartimaeus, and these same people changed their attitudes. The third view that we're going to look at is from Jesus' sake. Jesus in this passage actually shows me that he has humility, that he is willing to serve the least. When Jesus stopped, he showed me that, hey, I have compassion. I'm not going to just ignore him. The question is, do we have this same kind of a heart for those in need? You know, again, they were heading to Jerusalem for the Passover, but Jesus is saying, I'm not too busy. I'm not too proud to stop and minister to those who are in need. Jesus is never too busy, is he? But the funny thing is, sometimes we're too busy for him. Sometimes we are too busy for others. Maybe those that we think are annoying. Maybe our children. Jesus said, call him. You know, in Hebrews 12, it says, The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's John 6, 44. Jesus knew about Bartimaeus and this encounter before he even arrived in Jericho. This was not a chance encounter. When we meet Jesus, it's because he calls us, not because we call him. Jesus calls out to each of us. And then he says what? Go, your faith has healed you. Jesus spoke a word and Bartimaeus received his sight. He said Bartimaeus' faith made him whole. Notice here that Jesus didn't have to touch him. He didn't have to put spit or clay in his eyes. He healed him seemingly without having touched him. When he healed him, he said, your faith has made you well. He said, you know who I am. You know I'm the son of David. You know my power. You know what I can do for you. That's why you're sitting here waiting for me. And I wonder to myself, do I act like this when, when Jesus calls me? Am I like Bartimaeus? Do I have that same kind of faith? So when we look at Jesus, we know that Jesus is not just a man of his words. He's a man of his deeds, and he's willing to stop for the least of these. After these three perspectives, I just wanted to compare and contrast Bartimaeus' response with that of James and John from the passage just before. What do you want me to do for you? The exact same question that he asked Bartimaeus, he also asked James and John. Starting at verse 35, James and John came to him, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? 
We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with a baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. This is so different than Bartimaeus' answer, right? Bartimaeus said, Jesus, have mercy on me. You know, Jesus actually announced two times before this what's going to happen. In chapter 8 and chapter 9 of Mark, he already said, I'm going to have to go and make the greatest sacrifice. So I don't think the significance of their request, I'm sorry, I don't think the significance of that sacrifice had really sunk in to James and John or else they would not be asking for this. And interestingly, Jesus didn't scold them. I would be probably yelling at them. But Jesus didn't scold them. He just simply asked, what do you want me to do for you? Why? Why did he ask that? Why did he ask Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Don't you think Jesus knew? Hey, he's blind. <laughs> it's pretty simple. You don't go to a fish and chip store asking for hamburgers, right? You go there for fish and chips. The guy's blind. Of course, he wants you to heal his blindness. But why did he ask, what do you want me to do for you? Because Jesus wants us to express our request. He wants to hear it. You know, children often ask, why do we got to ask God these things? Because he already knows, right? Yeah, he knows. But he wants to hear us say that. And so he asked James and John, what do you want me to do for you? To be fair to James and John, you know, I don't think this was just something that they pulled out of the air. If you read Matthew chapter 28, Jesus did say something that is along these lines. He said, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the man, uh, sorry, when the son of man sits on his throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's aligned with what Jesus had already promised. I'm not defending James and John, but it's not just pulled out of thin air. But you compare this to Bartimaeus, who just humbly asked for his sight, with these two brothers selfishly asking for places of honor, and you feel a little uneasy, right? I mean, I don't know about your feelings, but Warren Wearsby, in his commentary, he wrote, we are embarrassed and ashamed to read of James and John asking for thrones. How could they and their mother be so callous and selfish? I remember when I was in junior high in eighth grade, I was on the basketball team for school, at the school, and I was far from the best player. I was not even a starter, but I also wasn't the worst. And I remember one of the kids who whose skill was a little bit worse than mine, after our practice, he went up to one of our two coaches, John, and he said, John, um, I want to talk to you. And John said, yes, what? He said, I think I'm ready to start. And I remember in the locker room, we just all started laughing. What are you talking about? You can't start. But that's what James and John are saying. Hey, Jesus, we're ready to start on the team. Bartimaeus was not like that. Bartimaeus simply just wanted to have a, a, a jersey. He just wanted to be part of Jesus' group. Uh, one last thing, I'm going to talk about Bartimaeus again. The Bible doesn't give us much information about his personal life, but it does tell us his name, Bar Timaeus, means the son of Timaeus. Bar is the Aramic prefix that says son. For instance, if uh, you are a Jewish boy at the age of 12, you have what? A bar mitzvah. Mitzvah, it means commandment or law. So you, at the age of 12, the boy becomes the son of the law. My, uh, one of my children is named Barnabas. Uh, Nabis means consolation or encouragement. So his name means son of encouragement. And I'm thinking, why is it in this Bible that I'm reading, it mentions Bartimaeus as the son of Timaeus. It didn't mention this about the other two individuals that Jesus had healed, right? And then it dawned on me, it's Bartimaeus' response that we know 
his name. Bartimaeus wasn't touched by Jesus, but on being cured, what happens? It says he immediately received his sight and followed Jesus. He followed Jesus. He spent time with him. He got to know the other disciples. When Mark documented this account, he knew his name. He knew what to write down here. Bartimaeus' response is an example for us to follow. I think it's a sign of being a true disciple because you recognize it was the grace of God that called you to him. And so he, shared, he showed his gratitude and loyalty to the one who changed his life. Uh, one last thought. It's not on any of these slides, but I'm thinking there's another group that wasn't mentioned here. I'm thinking Bartimaeus must have had some friends. The reason why I think that is because he is without his sight. There must have been some friends who positioned him, positioned him along the road and said, hey, listen, this is, this is the best place where we're going to have the closest proximity to Jesus as he walks by. And when he walks by, we'll let you know when to shout out. There's no point yelling out, you know, when it's just the crowd. And so when the parade's coming down, they're probably saying, okay, not yet, not yet. It's just the crowd. Or maybe it's Andrew or maybe it's James and John with their heads, you know, down in embarrassment. Okay, Jesus is coming up maybe 10 seconds from now. There must have been somebody there along with Bartimaeus to help him. When we see the needy, are we willing to be their friend? Are we willing to help them? So I have uh, five takeaways from this passage. The first is that Bartimaeus was persistent in his prayer. He didn't give up when he was facing opposition or discouragement. No, he shouted even more. It says he shouted twice. He could have been shouting repetitively a number of times. And he didn't let his blindness stop him from reaching out to Jesus. We, likewise, shouldn't let our own obstacles stop us from reaching out to Christ. We can learn to pray with perseverance, even though we don't get an immediate answer to our first one, our, our first request. We just need to know God actually does hear us, and he does care for us. The second takeaway is that Bartimaeus had faith that Jesus is the son of David, and therefore the Messiah. He called out to him for mercy. And we need to learn to trust Jesus, not only as our Lord and Savior, but as a real person, a real individual who wants to have an intimate relationship with us. He wants to have a personal relationship with us. When Bartimaeus called out to Jesus, and Jesus stopped. To me, that is huge. That's the biggest thing that I saw in this passage. He stopped. The Savior of the world, the awaited Messiah, stopped mid-journey for Bartimaeus. And then what? He waited. He waited as he called to the crowd and said, please call him over here. The Messiah, the Savior of the world, waits for us. He waits for us. The third thing is that I think Bartimaeus was humble and obedient. He threw aside his cloak, which probably, like we said, was his only possession. He jumped to his feet. This morning I was trying to get Dorcas to hurry up so we can walk out. and I said, Dorcas, why is it when I call you, you don't answer me? Bartimaeus, no, he jumped to his feet. I wish my kids would do that. Hope, do you hear? Hope's still sitting here. He was obedient. He didn't ask for something that he wanted. He only asked for his sight. He only asked for what he needed. He wanted to see. He didn't ask for a place of honor, a place of position. He didn't ask for fame. He didn't ask for money. Maybe if he had money, you could go see a good optometrist who could heal him, right? He didn't ask for a promotion with a nice title. He only asked for what he needed. And sometimes that's what we need to do. Only ask for what we need and to ask with faith. And it might mean that we need to surrender those things that are important to us. The fourth takeaway I have is 
be ready to cast aside your obstacles? Are we ready to leave everything behind and to follow him? Or are we hampered on? Are we hampered with all the stuff that we hold on to in this life? Could it be our possessions? I think most of us have more possessions than we actually need. How about time? We have this perception, I don't have enough time. But here's an interesting thought. I always feel like I don't have enough time. But God, the creator, has all the time in the world for us. Why don't I have the time? Don't let these obstacles distract us. Don't let them block us from God. You know, obstacles are always thrown our way. One thing I notice whenever I prepare a Bible study, whenever I prepare a sermon, and they take hours, weird things start happening. I get work calls. I get problems over at the sites. I get family issues. How come these things don't happen when I'm not busy? The enemy will throw obstacles at you. Be ready to cast aside our cloaks. And the last thing is, remember the least of these. Bartimaeus belonged to the marginalized. Bartimaeus belonged to the afterthoughts. He's amongst the group of people that we don't normally notice. But Jesus noticed. Jesus stopped, he waited, and he ministered to him. The least of these is a phrase that comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 40. I'm going to read that. For I was hungry and gave, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and gave you drink? And when did we, and when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The least of these refers to those in a variety of needy situations. It's always easy to minister to the needy when they are your friend or your family member or a colleague, somebody you know. But what if the needy was the grumpy neighbor down the hall that never says hello to you? Or somebody that you regularly see but don't speak to? Or a brother and sister whom you see at church but don't know? Or your pastor? Or your wife or husband? You know, in this context, Jesus is saying, those who cared for such individuals, you're not only serving them, you're serving Christ himself. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the example of Bartimaeus and the instruction that you give to us, Father. Help us to see these individuals through your optics, Lord. Help us to find opportunities to meet their needs. Help us to be ready to cast aside the things that prevent us from reaching you or being close to you and recognize that you are always calling us even though we are not prepared. Father, I just pray that uh, you would impress these things on our heart and help us to learn. In your son's name we pray, amen.